What's up, students? I hope you're having the best day of your life today, getting really close to the exam. Today, let's look at a QQT a little bit longer. Let's stick with these rods and these discs. I know the one I posted the other day, there were so many questions. So I just want to make sure that we really have this locked in as we enter the exam, because I have a really, really good feeling that there's going to be angular momentum on this year's assessment. All right, so here we go. We got this pivot point. We have a rod. Here's the center of mass. It has the thing that's annoying about this is we usually call the length of the rod L, right? Not D. And then we also usually call this impact point R, not X. So that was a little annoying in this case how they wanted to change the variables, but that's not too big of a deal. We can handle it. We're going to have a frictionless surface here. So that's really important. That's really nice. A frictionless pivot so we don't have to worry about anything there. Um, the rod initially is motionless, so VI of the rod is going to be equal to zero. That means it's not going to have any angular momentum, nothing that's awesome, but it's free to rotate. A student will slide a disc of some mass, so they just say that the mass of this is just mask disc, and a velocity V0, and that's going to be a linear velocity. But remember, because it is still at some R from the pivot point, Although this disc is not rotating, it still has an angular momentum. Super, super important to remember. And then the disc is going to stick to the rod. That's going to be also very, very important moving forward. The disc is going to stick to the rod. So we're going to have the sum, sum of the moment of inertia is after impact. And the student wants uh, the rod disc system to end up with as much angular speed as possible. So we want angular speed to go up. And we know that we're going to do that by increasing the angular momentum on the rod. The greater the angular momentum or the greater the final speed of the rod, the more it is going to rotate in this counterclockwise. And when it rotates in this counterclockwise way, we're going to get a really big theta. So now let's work on some of these questions and see exactly what they want us to do. Suppose that the rod is much more massive than the disc. To give the rod as much angular speed as possible, should the student make the disc hit it to the left of point C, to the middle of C, or out here to the right of C. Now guys, this one needs to be a layup, okay? It's gonna to be to the right of C, and there's a number of different explanations that you can give for this. The easiest one is, as you hit the rod further from the impact point, you are gonna apply more torque. Torque equals some perpendicular force times R. So as R goes up, so does torque, and torque also equals I alpha, where alpha, is equal to a change in WT. So the larger the alpha, the greater the change in momentum, and therefore the greatest theta, the greatest final speed. So as I increase torque, I increase alpha, I increase speed. I want this disc to hit the rod further from the pivot point, the farthest point from the pivot point I can. This right here would be the ideal spot. And if you remember in class when I had somebody trying to hold the door open with their pinky, very easy to do right here because of that torque force where virtually impossible to hold a door open with your pinky right here. On the internet, well, there you go. That's how you know it's hogwash poopy cock. The student finds a following equation for the post-collision angular speed, and this is what they find on the internet. And who cares if that's right or wrong? And they say that regardless of where the equation for angular speed is correct, so we don't care, does it apply, does it agree with the quantitative reasoning part A? So let's see. We said that the further I go from the pivot point, right, that's going to be the greatest increase in speed. So does this really tell me that? Well, yeah, because they calling X is really the R here, right? So as I increase X, I'm, quote, increasing R, increasing torque, and blah, blah, blah. So if we look right here, it's super small, but they have M disk X V naught in the numerator right? So as X goes up, what happens to W? If we use this equation, it was correct, then yeah, it would work out. It also works out because if we take this over here and we say that TI is equal to greatest speed. So the larger the inertia, the lower the speed. So there's an indirect relationship here. So that indirect relationship is also true. But I specifically wouldn't talk about this because we didn't change the eye of the rod. So essentially, this was constant, and this was constant, and this was constant. The only thing to really vary was X, and we see that relationship, that direct relationship between X and V. Therefore, I'm going to say it's correct. Another student driving an equation for the post-collision of the angular speed W of the rod makes a mistake, oops, and comes up with this equation right here. 
And I'm just going to draw this equation a little bit bigger. I'll do it in a different color. What color? Hmm, let's go pink. So this is what the student came up with. W equals I X V naught over M disc D to the fourth. Holy Toledo Batman. So without deriving the correct equation and saying you're wrong because here's the right equation, that's essentially what they mean. How can you tell that this equation is not plausible? In other words, that it does not make physical sense and then explain. So using that, I see that they have speed and moment of inertia in a direct relationship. That is not the case, right? This is a resistance to want to spin. The greater the resistance to want to spin, the harder it is going to be to change an object speed. So this relationship here does not make any sense. Also, too, another thing is the mass here. Mass gives a larger angular momentum which is going to increase the speed of an object. So the larger the mass, the greater the angular momentum, therefore the greater final speed as well. So this should be a direct relationship between M and W. So that's another reason why that does not seem plausible to me. So to clean that up, I would just simply say the greater M of the disk will give a greater angular momentum and therefore a greater speed. And this direct relationship is not shown by the equation. It's shown by an indirect. So let's look at part D now. Immediately before the collision with the rod, we have a moment of inertia. So I is equal to mx squared, which is mr squared. That's pretty accurate. And the angular momentum with respect to the pivot, so L, is going to be equal to mv naught x. Derive an equation for the post-angular speed w of the rod express in these variables right here in any physical constants that are appropriate. Okay. All right. So we can do that pretty easily. We know that the angular momentum initial is going to be equal to the angular momentum final. Before the collision, we have the angular momentum of the rod plus the angular momentum of the disc. And that's going to be a little bit different after because the two things are going to stick together. So we are going to have the angular momentum of the disc slash rod system. We can now clean this up a little bit. The angular momentum of the rod initially was equal to zero. The angular momentum of the disc was given as m disc v naught x. And then after, we know that we are going to have the moment of inertia of the disc plus the moment of inertia of the rod times the final speed of this object. And guys, this is very, very similar than when we did momentum. Remember p before equals p after? And then we had two carts that stuck together and we had to take their M's and sum the masses and then we had the final speed of that total inelastic collision. Well, in rotation, I acts as that quote unquote M, the mass of that object. So this, we're going to have the sum of the moments of inertia times the final speed. So the moment of inertia of the disk was given as M disk X squared plus the moment of inertia rod was not given. So I'm just going to call that I rod equals VF. So the angular speed final is going to be equal to M D V naught X divided by M D X squared plus I of the rod. That's as simple and as clean as I can make it. I can't cancel these M's out guys because this would be bad math. And even if I made this some sort of M, it would be the M of the rod. So they would be different. I've seen students try and cancel those M's out or try and cancel these X's out. It has to be in every single term. Like you'd have to think, can I factor it out? Then I could cancel it out. But this is not factored out. So this is as simple as you can make this equation. And this right here is the right one. And it's in terms of all the things that they asked us to leave it in. Part E says, all right, now instead of it sticking together, now it bounces back off the rod instead of sticking to it. The post-collision uh, post angular speed of the rod when the disc bounces off is greater or less than or equal to the post-collision speed when it sticks to it. It's going to be greater, and we can show that mathematically, or we can explain it in words. We know that there's no outside forces or torques acting, so we know that momentum is going to be conserved. So we just found WF of this system. So let's see if we can go, and now it bounces back. So we'd have the exact same L initial, which would be M disk V X equals, now I would have the mass of the disk V final X, which is going to be the angular momentum of the disc after, but now this is going to be moving in the opposite direction. So that's going to be negative plus the IW of the rod. So now we see M disc V naught 
X plus M disc, the final X divided by the I of the rod, that equals now W. And this value is greater than this value right here, right? As you divide by a larger number, this gets smaller. Here, the numerator is getting bigger, therefore W gets bigger. And that would be the explanation that you use to show that this is greater when momentum is conserved. All right, guys, so I hope this was a good added practice with the pivots hitting the rod. I'll leave the video of the explanation when I first did these notes months ago, and I'll also leave the solution video from the one last week so you can get two good practice problems with the ball hitting a rod. Like I said, definitely something I think you're going to see this year. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. Let me know. I hope you guys have an amazing day.